Hello everyone, welcome to this module of Hematology. I am Ayan Paricha, a third professional part 1 MBBS student at RGO Medical College. And right now for this video or for this video series per se, I am your educator at MME. Thanks a lot, Make Medical Easy to providing me the platform to help you with the idea of Hematology. Right. So let's, without any ado, let's dive into the topic. But before that, I would like to tell you that most of the doubts I will try to cover up in the video lecture itself. But even after that, if you have any doubts, you can always DM me up in my Insta handle that is at the rate ayan underscore paricha zero zero. Over there, if you DM me, I will definitely answer your question. Or otherwise, you can send the doubts to MME platform. And they will be redirecting the question to me. Both the ways will work the same. So you can do that. And also you can go and check out my YouTube channel that is the Nerd Medic over there. I also post a lot of videos regarding the MBBS curriculum and the different topics of biology and medicine at large. So let's dive into the topic. Now the story that we are going to start off today is the circulation. But are we really starting the story over here? Actually no. The circulation story is comprised of these three things. What are these things? First it is comprised of the heart. It has the vessels of the heart. And it has the fluid that it contains, right? So it has the heart, it has the vessel and the fluid. The story of the heart has already been taken up by one of my colleagues, that is Shubhadev. Shubhadev is already taking, taking the topic of heart. Now I have been given the topic of discussing the fluid, which is blood. So I will be talking about the blood as a whole. So the story of circulation is vast. Now I will be giving you the point of view from blood. Shubhadev is already giving you the point of view of heart. So by that, we will together make your understanding rock solid, right? So let's come to my topic that is hematology. So what is hematology? Hemato means blood and the logy once again means knowledge or something like that and not very good in Latin. So basically the knowledge of blood or learning about blood is all about hematology. So hematology is, let, uh, let me give a basic understanding of hematology to you. Hematology per se is a medical super speciality. It's a medical super speciality. All right. You can perceive it as a super speciality after you finish off your MD medicine or MD pediatrics. Now, hematology is a subject which remains in the is a, as a keystone in the medical sciences. It can link you to physiology. It links you to pathology. It again comes back in your pharmacology. And once you think that you're done with studying hematology, again in your final year, it will come back in medicine and in pediatrics, right? And to some extent in gynecology, that is OBG. You will see this subject in so many subjects, right? So this is a vast subject. I will try to provide you with the physiology aspect of hematology over here, right? Okay, so let's get into that. Now, hematology deals with a lot of idea that is it deals with the blood itself so blood has something known as plasma and it has something known as the cells now plasma has again separate separate contents that we will be dealing with later on in later some video now it has different cells we all know this is our school level biology that it has something known as the red cells uh, let me take a highlighter for you it has something known as the red cells it has something known as the white cells and it has something known as the platelets right so basically this is the idea so blood has something known as the plasma and apart from that, it has something known as the cells or formed elements, right? Now over here, a very important viva question that I would like to discuss with you is that why the cells are known as formed elements? Because they are formed. Now why they are known as formed elements? This is one of my professor's most favorite question. Now remember, form means shape. Now these cells have their own unique shape and that as the cells have very unique shapes, they are known as formed elements. Form means figure, form, etc. Right? So this is a very, very, very important question from Viva. Many people ask this question if you are going for an honors or a CA exam in physiology or even gold medal, you can get this Viva question. Right? So let's dive in. Now, let's come to the topic of blood cells per se. Now for blood cells, the story begins way before birth. Now before birth, what happens? You remain in, in your mother's womb in a this bacha kind of condition. Now this is known as the fetus. I hope you all know. Uh, since you people are in the first year, I will try to make you guys acquainted with many of the terms that we use in medicine per se. Uh, so this is fetus and in the fetus, we have some structure known as the yolk sac. Right? You will study all these things in details in the embryology. Whoever will be taking up the embryology will detail on all these topics. 
so don't worry just remember the terms fetus fetus has a part known as yolk sac it's like a body part for the fetus right in that yolk sac around the time of third week now third week of what sir third week of intrauterine life sir we are talking about things before birth so whatever before birth we remain in my in our mother's uterus right so that part of our life that around 9 months of time that we spend within our mother's womb that part is known as intrauterine life so that is in short written as iul right remember this so around third week of iul this intrauterine the yolk sac receives something known as the known as something known as the hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cells right so in yolk sac hematopoietic stem cells occur right now remember that they are stem cells now why they are known as hematopoietic now again let us come to that language wala thing that is hemato hemato means blood poiesis means synthesis now these are certain cells will be, which will be synthesizing blood so cells can synthesize which component of the blood definitely sir they can synthesize the cell component of the blood that means hematopoietic stem cells are those stem cells which will be synthesizing the cells of the blood which are we just learned that called as formed elements right can you can you understand this can you connect the two two things medicine is all about connecting the dots learn to connect the dots and if you are good at connecting dots medicine will be a simple piece of cake walk for you never mind and never you don't have to wo worry about things i will help you to connect the dots not a problem right so we know at so what we learned this is something known as fetus in the fetus we have something known as the yolk sac in the yolk sac around third week of intrauterine life what appears certain cells appear what are those cells those cells are hematopoietic stem cells right so basically let's uh, shrink this up what happens uh, it is third week iul and over here in hsc occurs in the yolk sac right now what happens this hematopoietic stem cell goes to organ that is very very much known to you what is that organ that organ is known as liver at around what time at around third month again of intrauterine life so from the yolk sac the hematopoietic stem cells move to liver at around third month of intrauterine life do they go only to liver here comes a very important concept many people think that they only go to liver many people know that also but as my students you should always remember no sir they don't go to liver only they go to some organ known as the spleen you will learn in anatomy about it about its anatomy in details they go to spleen anywhere else do they go yes sir they go to they go to lymph node some organ known as lymph node also okay so what happened around third month of intrauterine life they the hematopoietic stem cells go to liver mainly in the liver and to some extent so for that i will be making the liver wala arrow very dark so that very bold arrow for liver right so they mainly go to the liver apart from that they go to spleen and lymph node also right now why i am talking about spleen and lymph node they have very 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 important clinical correlation just hang on with me i will be telling you the clinical correlation just remember that they go to spleen and lymph node now what happens now from this liver and spleen and lymph node what happens from these two organs these stem hematopoietic stem cells move to somewhere known as the bone marrow at around what time they move into fourth month of intrauterine life so at around fourth month of intrauterine life they move into something known as the bone marrow and from fourth month onward bone marrow becomes the main site of hematopoiesis this we all know right this we have already studied in class uh, 11 while when we learned circulation right so they go to bone marrow and over there they uh, go do a lot of hematopoiesis and stuff they produce rbcs wbcs platelets blah 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 stuff happens we will see that later on right now at birth after that what happens at birth bone marrow is the only site of only site of hematopoiesis 
right okay so basically this is the idea so let's sum up what we learned the story before birth what happened so in the story before birth we had around third week hematopoietic stem cells were in the yolk sac then at around third month third week then third month they came to mainly liver some very few went to lymph node and very few went to spleen right then what happened at around fourth month of intrauterine life they came to somewhere known as the bone marrow and they stayed there right wahi rehna hai kidhar nahi jana so they stayed there so at around birth bone marrow became the only site of hematopoiesis that is also important so over here we have done four important points that you should note down in your copy if you want the first point second point third point fourth point now we will come to the clinical correlation for fast just remember the spleen and lymph node wala story right so after that what happens after that let's talk about the bone a bit right now to understand about bone marrow we have to learn basic anatomy of bone marrow which we require for this class right let us see now if you take a long bone you all are very much acquainted with some concepts of anatomy i know if you take a long bone long bone has something known as let me draw a random doggy bone right this is a random doggy bone and in this doggy bone if you see this middle part is known as the diaphysis right and these parts are known as epiphysis something known as epiphysis right you all know this and there is something you all know over here there remains something known as the metaphysis okay so metaphysis we don't want to discuss over here we have nothing to do with metaphysis and the diaphysis very important question for anatomy let me tell you that most of the diaphysis are triangular in shape they have three surfaces and three borders similarly over here also we have our diaphysis which which is triangular in shape now if we look at a diaphysis of a long bone we can see that the outside part has a specific kind of consistency this is known as the cortical bone right or compact bone see the bone is compactly arranged and the inner part is known as medullary bone or cancellous bone or spongy bone why so let us understand what happens so outside we have something known as the cortical bone and inside we have something known as a spongy why it is known as spongy you all know like, like if you, if you look at the appearance of it it looks like sponge itself so that, that's why it is known as a spongy bone right and cancellous why because people think that it was once a cortical compact bone but the compactness has lost there has been cancellations within the compactness this parts where the compact bone bone was once present is not any more so that's why it is known as a cancellous bone right and this is also known as medullary bone now at this point i would like you to remember one very important concept of biology that you will require time and again in your study period in medicine that whenever you have an organ the outer portion of that organ is always known as the cortex inner portion is always known as the medulla so similarly in case of a bone the outer part is known as the cortex that's why the cortical bone the inner part is known as medulla so medullary bone now in the medullary bone since it is spongy or cancellous in between the bones we have certain spaces right now since we have certain spaces those spaces are filled with the bone marrow so the bone marrow that we were talking about for so long that bone marrow remains in the spongy bone in the spaces of the spongy bone the bone marrow remains and we also learned in the fourth point in the previous slide that bone marrow is the main site or the only site of hematopoiesis after birth right that means we can say that the hematopoiesis goes on in the medullary cavity of the bone or the medullary bone okay so we can say that the hematopoiesis goes on in medullary cavity so that kind of hematopoiesis is known as medullary hematopoiesis my handwriting is very bad please pardon me for that so medullary hematopoiesis that because the hematopoiesis is going on in medullary cavity right now in case of increased demand suppose you require a lot of blood cell production in that case when your bone marrow is not able to meet the demand what happens you bring in more people to work 
in that situation when the medullary bone medullary cavity is not able to reach the demand or meet the demand of your blood cells they go for extra medullary sites extra medullary sites for bone marrow synthesis right that is known as extra medullary hematopoiesis outside medulla extra means outside medulla right where that will happen that will happen in liver spleen and to some extent lymph node because they had few hematopoietic stem cells left now they can jump into the work and do the do the stuff for that whenever you have something known as extra medullary hematopoiesis you will see in your clinical practice or ward visits that you will invariably or in most of the situations you will encounter something known as hepatosplenomegaly hepatospleno megaly this was the clinical correlate i was talking about so why hepatosplenomegaly because the liver enlarges spleen enlarges why they enlarge because they are doing a lot of work what work they were doing their own normal work along with that they have got added work what work got added the work of doing hematopoiesis since they got added work they increase their size that causes hepatosplenomegaly megalo means enlarging so this is the clinical presentation of extra medullary hematopoiesis now we will be discussing about this in a lot and lot of detail while we will be discussing about anemia in pathology or in the physiology part also to some extent right so this much is clear so we what we learned in this slide we learned about the structure of the bone and we know that diaphysis has some outer cortical bone inner medullary bone the diaphysis has outer cortical bone in a medullary bone and in the medulla we have the bone marrow that bone marrow causes medullary hematopoiesis and there are certain extra medullary sites of hematopoiesis which are liver mainly liver most important apart from that spleen and lymph node also so over here one important point two important point three and yeah four right these four points you should be remembering right now let's move take the story a step further now bone marrow has two kinds of cell two types now bone marrow if we talk about bone marrow let us see what kind of bone marrow are there now bone marrow can be something known as a red bone marrow and there is something known as a yellow bone marrow right now why yellow bone marrow now whenever you hear the word yellow in your anatomy physiology or in medicine per se you should always uh, think of one and one kind of cell what is that cell yes sir that is oil droplets or adipocytes now how adipocytes look okay for that usual use the logical part of the brain what happens adipocytes contain what lipids now lipids means what in simple household language lipids mean ghee makkhan now i have seen one makkhan amul makkhan apna makkhan now what is the color of amul makkhan sir amul makkhan is yellow so adipocytes also look yellow that means adipose tissue also looks yellow that means whenever bone marrow is yellow that means it also has some adiposity it has increased adipose tissue if you are accommodating adipose tissue sir in your place that means the number of effective bone cells are low yes or no the number of effective bone cells are low that's why you have place to accommodate adipose tissue suppose you are living in your home in home you have four rooms and you are only three people so one room remains vacant if one people lives in one room then you can accommodate another person in your home right similarly if you have less number of cells then you can accommodate adipose tissue you have accommodated adipose tissue that means that this yellow bone marrow has low functionality its functioning is low since it, is, it has low functionality it has space to accommodate adipose tissue but what is red bone marrow red bone red bone marrow is a place which is which has very high functionality and is very functional so the thing that i want you to remember is that the red bone marrow is the functional bone marrow is a functional bone marrow yellow bone marrow is adiposed bone marrow or fatty bone marrow and it has decreased function another thing for your clinical point of view you should remember that adipose tissue always looks yellow now the main crux of medical sciences is correlating things you have to correlate your practical with your theory knowledge and this practical theory combined knowledge has to be correlated with the clinical knowledge right this is where the medical science differs from the sciences of 
uh, your biology now biology people only do the theoretical stuff and at the most they deal with the practical stuff of it they correlate with the practical stuff those people who go for phd and stuff they correlate with the practical level apart from that those who, those who ever go in the college level they mainly deal with theoretical stuff but here comes the difference with medicine in medicine even though we are in our undergraduate degree we have to always think of correlating the practical with the theory theory with the clinic and clinic with the practical now what is this this is your theory that i taught about adipose tissue now this is your practical part now whenever you will be seeing the adipose tissue the practicals you will see that you will have you will have this round round structures round round white round bubble like structures this white round bubble like structures in a slide of histology are adipose tissues now this is a picture of yellow bone marrow see there are a lot of cells here and there a lot of cells are there but there's so many fatty tissue so 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 many and now so we learned about the theoretical aspect we learned about the practical aspect that we will be seeing in our physical uh, anatomy and pathology practical classes and now come to the clinical aspect of it whenever you will be looking into a dead body that is cadaver or into a living body from second year onwards you will have your clinical postings so in the clinical postings you will be going to the operation theaters in the operation theaters you will be seeing incisions now if you see over here this region this yellow yellow structures that you can see in the skin incision over here these are adipose tissue what i told you just now adipose tissue is what just like tail and makkhan so tail and makkhan are amul makkhan amul makkhan looks yellow adipose tissue also looks yellow right so this is the crux of learning medical sciences this is how i always try to present my lectures so it's not basically you have to understand that whenever a teacher or an educator teaches you something that person doesn't there's nothing called as a standard way of teaching every teacher has their own point of view of presenting to you so this is my point of view into the hematology and whenever i present my point of view i try to present my point of view into three different layers the first layer is theoretical next layer is practical and finally the layer goes up and escalates up into the clinical level because in medicine you have to ultimately be competent to deal with things in a clinical level and that's why i always whenever i try to teach something i always correlate these things the theory uh, theory practical and the clinical stuff so throughout my lectures you will be finding that i always try to correlate 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 stuff this triangle of theory practical and clinical is a triangle of medicine this triangle of medicine is very much evident in my in my type of teaching right so what do you think of that if you have any suggestions like what do you think about this teaching style do let me know in the comments below right now as i was saying the practical stuff more of practical stuff about bone marrow red and yellow over here if you can see uh, this bone marrow over here see a lot of cells see this purplish things are nuclei now whenever i will be teaching you histology or i believe there is another educator supriya ma'am is teaching histology now she is doing that now in her lectures i believe you have learned how to identify cells and how to identify cytoplasm right so over here you can see that over here the bone marrow has filled with a lot of cells so this is a lot of cells are very high over here right but over here see on the right hand side of the diagram what you can see there's there are cells there are cells right but over here a lot of lot and lot of fatty adipose tissue so this one is our red bone marrow this one is our yellow bone marrow now this finishes of our basic understanding of bone marrow we will come back to bone marrow again now one very important thing that you should be run learning over here a very important quote who gave i don't know but if you if you can identify the poster to comment down below if you can so this is from a very famous web series known as the house of cards american web series about the american politics like if you have watched that or if you want to watch that please do let me know in the comment section below i am a web series buff so then we can connect more on that so there is a very famous quote that behind every successful man there is a woman so that quote boils down to a level in biology now how that boils down in the level of biology and biology also we have behind every successful parenchymal cell there are stromal cells okay right this is my way of understanding the successful man wala quote right so for that we have to understand what are parenchymal cells and what are stromal cells right so basically what happens uh, in a bone in a tissue if you see there will be certain cells which are the functioning cells they are doing the actual job and there are many other cells which are just supporting them 
these are supporting cells support 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 all right so in your college you will see that doctors doctors and nurses are doing the main framework of the job the main job of healing and treating patients is being done by the doctors and nurses but there are many other staff there are cleaning staff there are ward boys ward girls blah 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 stuff a lot of lift mans engineers everybody is there in the hospital those people is neces necessary to get the hospital up and running but they don't directly contribute into patient care right similarly if you take the example like doctors and nurses are the main cells of the system of hospital but they are supported by some other supporting cells which are lift man cleaning man the ward boy these people all right the police staff who remain in the hospital all that people now whenever you have a tissue in biology in that tissue the cells which are functioning the main function those cells are known as parenchymal cell and the cells which are supporting the parenchymal cells are known as the stromal cell right the stromal cell okay now let's understand this quotation once more now behind every successful parenchymal cell there are stromal cells so stromal cells are very 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 important for the functioning of the parenchymal cells of the bone marrow now what are the parenchymal cells in the bone marrow now what are the parenchymal cells parenchymal cells are the hematopoietic stem cells my dear the hematopoietic stem cells the story is all about hematopoietic stem cells they are the most glorified people present in the bone marrow right now who are the stromal cells now we will have a small discussion on the stromal cells before we take the story any far, any further right now why stromal cells are important stromal cells importance of stromal cells make five very important mcqs for your neat pg slash next or ini cet and three very important viva questions so for that we have to talk something about the stromal cells of the bone marrow right so let's talk about the stromal cells Now, so what is the function of the stromal cells? Now, stromal cells secrete soluble factors. Soluble factors. It secretes certain soluble factors or keep factors soluble in the certain factors soluble in the extracellular matrix. What factors? The factors are growth factors. Right. Any cell requires a signal for growth. Whenever you will be learning mitosis in your biochemistry classes, you will learn that. for a cell to grow you need constant growth signals for a normal cell the story for cancerous cells are absolutely different they do not require any growth factor they without growth factor they apne aap mein balle balle hain wo sab khud hi grow kar lete hain but for any normal cell you require constant supply of growth factors for them to grow and stromal cells secrete few growth factors and they keep other growth factors which come from other parts of the body into the bone marrow in a soluble state so that the growth factors can be solubility is important for utilization i hope you are understanding solubility is required for utilization so that the growth factors can be utilized by the parenchymal cells and the parenchymal cells can perform their function well right now what are the growth factors we are coming to that another function of stromal cell is what another function of stromal cell is that they have certain adhesion molecules on their surface adhesion molecules on surface now what is the function of adhesion molecules sir you can understand from the very word itself adhesion means pakad ke rakhna it's like holding tight they hold it, they hold the parenchymal cells tightly in the bone marrow so that they cannot leave the bone marrow and stay in the bone marrow and do their job right suppose in a hospital there are management staff who keep a check on the doctors whether a doctor is coming on time or not whether a doctor is taking unnecessary leaves or not whether the doctor was on time for the ot or not the management staff also comes under the stromal cell criteria they they keep a check on everything like whether the doctor is serving enough hours in the hospital or not this management staff also go on the administration people they don't directly contribute to the healthcare but they manage doctors right and nurses so these adhesion molecules adhere to the bone marrow cells the parenchymal cells that is the hscs hematopoietic stem cells and keep them within the bone marrow now let's talk about the mcq so stromal cells have surface adhesion molecules and they help in utilization of growth factors stromal cells help in utilization of growth factors stromal cells have adhesion molecules so this adhesion molecules wala mcq was asked in 2005 aims pg and this growth factors utilization wala was asked in jipmer 2011 right okay 
Now, coming to the soluble factors, what are the soluble factors? Coming to the third MCQ, what are the soluble factors? Let's have a discussion on that. Yeah. So, something known as erythropoietin. So, you all, you all are very intelligent. You will have already studied this in your hormone chapter in class 11. Now, you know erythropoietin comes from an organ known as kidney. It comes from kidney remains in bone marrow. Who keeps it in the extracellular matrix soluble? Stromal cells. They keep the erythropoietin soluble. Now, what is the role of erythropoietin? We will see why in the later part of this story. Another one, thrombopoietin. GMCSF. Just write down the names. We will later on understand what are these things. Right? Now, it was asked which of the following is not a growth factor. And these four were in the options. Along with that, there was another option which is CSF. CSF and in CSF, it was written that cerebro spinal fluid and this was around 2000 2001 the question was asked in some state pg entrance for medical right now for that you have to remember one very important thing is that that this csf valor term that i wrote is not cerebrospinal fluid not cerebrospinal fluid this is colony stimulating factor just keep a note in your notes so that you remember this thing because this was an MCQ, right? Now, what is colony stimulating factor? What is colony? Pahle colony samjhenge, uske baad na samjhenge stimulate vagera. Story. That we will learn later on in the story. But for now, just remember this thing. And then why were what people will ask you? Tell some growth factors which aid the process of hematopoiesis. You will be able to say, yes, sir, that is thrombopoietin, thromb erythropoietin, GMCSF, GCSF and a lot more, right? Okay, now the last point which will again bring some viva questions and MCQ. That is bone marrow cells, Deco. we have something known as Netflix and chill, right? Now bone marrow cells have their own Netflix and chill. For Netflix, what do you need? There's something attractive that you have to keep you in place. So for the bone, for the hematopoietic stem cells, the Netflix part is nothing but your adhesion molecules. A very attractive thing which you keeps you keeps you bounded to the app or bounded to the bone marrow right and for chill you have to have some popcorns and juice that is basically your growth factor so basically if you have your netflix and chill that is addition and growth factor i can jolly well say that you have something known as your comfort zone right and remember these stem cells are the cells which make us humans so we all humans have the tendency to stay in our comfort zone always. So the cells will definitely have the tendency of staying in their comfort zones always. So since the comfort zone is created, the HSCs, the hematopoietic stem cells has a nature of staying in the bone marrow. Uh, right? And who creates the comfort zone? Stromal cells, sir. Right? Now, due to that comfort zone, HSCs have a tendency to come back to bone marrow from any part of the body. Suppose you inject a hematopoietic stem cell in, stem cell in the superior vena cava. That stem cell will, root, will circulate in the entire body, go here and there in the body and finally it will come back into a bone marrow. That tendency of the bone marrow to come back, uh, the tendency of HSC to come back to a bone marrow is known as something known as homing tendency. very very important mcq it was asked in 2016 neat pg right or whatever the all india entrance was named at that point of time so what they asked one stem cell shows homing tendency now there were hematopoietic stem cells this same stem cell that stem cell blah blah a lot of stem cell names were given now you were supposed to select that hscs shows a homing tendency that means get back to home why you want to get back to home because you want to do netflix and chill right that is addition and growth factors you have a lot of growth factors you have addition molecules you have balle balle yahi rahenge moch karenge hematopoiesis karenge right so homing tendency is again an important mcq now how we doctors use this homing tendency what's our use now we what we took we got our theoretical aspect over here now let's come to the clinical aspect 
Now bone marrow transplantation, there's something known as bone marrow transplantation that you will learn later on. So the bone marrow transplant. Now for transplantation, what we do, we inject the bone marrow into blood. Right? Now you can say that sir, bone marrow blood may to hematopoiesis nahi karega, it won't be, it's not gonna do hematopoiesis in the blood. Yes, it won't be doing the hematopoiesis in the blood. So why don't we put the bone marrow directly into a medullary cavity of a bone? Well, that's difficult and that's painful. So be better than that, it's to inject in the blood. Why sir? Because bone marrow has a homing tendency. When they, wherever in the goddamn body you inject the bone marrow, it will find its way back into the bone marrow. The hematopoietic stem cell inject injected anywhere in the blood at any part of the body it will find its way back into the bone marrow house so it will go back to bone marrow due to its homing tendency so this homing tendency is the principle behind bone marrow transplantation very important mcq very it was asked in plab those of you know what is a plab exam this was a mcq of plab examination homing tendency is the key concept behind bone marrow transplant right and in viva if you are going for honors and gold medal doctors will ask you your professors that why we inject bone marrow in the blood and why not in the bone so your answer will be sir when wherever in the blood we inject the bone marrow they are going to show homing tendency and go back to the bone marrow so we don't need to tra transplant the hematopoietic stem cell into the bone because injecting something into the bone is difficult requires a lot of skills it is painful and costly itself right so we learned a lot of things over here. So just quickly highlighting the stuff for you. We learned uh, homing tendency. We learned about the stromal cells function and the bone marrow transplant. So basically MCQs were over here uh, too. Uh, this one was MCQ and this one was MCQ, right? So we learned a lot about the bone marrow stem cells. Now let's move on to hematopoiesis. Now hematopoiesis we have, uh, for that we have to understand a concept known as the concept of stem cells, right? Okay. So what happens in the stem cells, what is the peculiarity of stem cells, uh, the process by which we can determine the difference between stem cells, that is stem cells uh, produce something known as a differentiated cell, differentiated cell, at the same point of time it produces one cell of its kind as well, right. So if it does a mitosis, suppose it is doing something known as a mitosis, whenever it does mitosis, it does not produce two equally stem cells. One cell is just like itself, that is a stem cell. Another cell is something blah 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 stuff it can produce. What it produces we will see, a different kind of a cell. Just for now remember it produces a blah blah different kind of a cell. But at all point of time it will be producing a cell exactly like it. So that the stem cell numbers never de decrease. Suppose over here we had one stem cell. Finally we had one stem cell first. And finally what we are getting? One stem cell, one new cell. Right. So the number of stem cell is constant. Initially it was one stem cell. After the division also we have one stem cell, right? So this is a unique mitosis feature of stem cells that you have to always, 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 always remember. So this will be asked in your uh, pathology. Like what is the difference between the division of a stem cell and a random other cell? Like stem cell will always regenerate a stem cell. So the mitosis over here, the main question that is asked that is it has a regeneration component to it. Regeneration component. That is very important that you have to remember, right? Now, let's come to the idea of hematopoiesis. Now, hematopoiesis, we learned about that. What is hematopoiesis? Hematopoiesis synthesis of blood cells. We learned about the blood cells and we will be seeing the blood cells in a while. So, let's see the blood. This is the practical part. This is the theory part. Right? And let's move into the theoretical part. Before that, let's talk about the practical ones. So today we are going to talk about the erythropoiesis right in this video series. So over there let's talk about the blood cells. So these cells that you can see these are the erythrocytes. So this is your practical aspect whenever you will be doing a physiology practical or pathology practical whenever you will be doing a peripheral blood smear staining you will be seeing blood cells like this. So these are your RBCs or erythrocytes. Now to, we will be trying to learn about erythrocytes first right. Okay, so this is a just a bit of revision what we learned right now. We learned about the blood cells and the plasma. We are talking about red blood cells in particular, mainly cells. We will be getting into the first into red blood cells. Then we will move into the WBCs. Then we will move into the platelets and that and that's how we are going to finish off the hematology part of your physiology. Right now, let's come into the bone marrow. We are back into the bone marrow. Now in the bone marrow over here, uh, not bone marrow, actually we are within the bone. So this is the cortical bone. This is your medullary bone. 
right now what happens in the bone marrow we have certain capillaries these capillaries are known as sinusoids these are known as sinusoids now what is the speciality of sinusoids sinusoids are capillaries which has discontinuous basement membrane so since they have discontinuous basement membrane what is the gain from that it has certain spaces between the endothelial cells now these spaces are essential for hematopoietic cells or after an rbc or wbc is formed they have to come to the blood supply right so what they do they pass through these gaps and enter the blood supply through circulation that passing through is known as something known as diapedesis that we will learn later but that for the passing through you require some broken or some spacious kind of capillary so this is a special kind of capillary with a lot of space in between the endothelial cells and this is known as something known as sinusoid okay so let's continue with the overview of the erythropoiesis so what happens in the erythropoiesis we have something known as the hematopoiety stem cell here comes your hematopoiety stem cell about which we have been talking for so long this is the hematopoiety stem cell that gets converted uh, that goes into something known as common myeloid progenitor common myeloid progenitor gives rise to mega carrier erythroid progenitor that goes into something known as pro erythroblast pro erythroblast goes something into early normoblast early normoblast gets into something known as intermediate normoblast intermediate normoblast goes into something known as late normoblast late normoblast produces reticulocyte reticulocyte produces something known as rbc so this was a basic idea let, let you have to remember the names these are very important pathology and physiology mcqs right so what happens over here let's understand so over here uh, this uh, this hematopoietic stem cell is a pluripotent stem cell now what is potency that's a whole different ball game we will discuss that somewhere else or you can check that up you can ask me that personally in the my instagram for dms right let's not get into that in this video that will over complicate stuff so over here you can see three things over here we have a large nucleus we have a basophilic cytoplasm and we have uh, something known as euchromatins the chromatins are not arranged in a heterochromatin or chromo chromosome per se right now this thing gradually gradually shifts into something known as eosinophilic cytoplasm eosinophilic cytoplasm why it becomes eosinophilic cytoplasm that you have to remember due to the presence of hemoglobin presence of hemoglobin makes it eosinophilic right and finally it becomes more eosinophilic and finally the rbc becomes a red deep red in color right okay so now why you have basophilic cytoplasm because it has a lot of acid contents in the cytoplasm what are the acid contents rna boss rna you have a lot of protein synthesis going on over here right okay so this is more or less the idea so the few basic ncqs that you are supposed to know the hb production starts over here in the proerythrocyte stage and you can see the nucleus over here the nucleus is extruded out uh, let me erase a few things from here see the nucleus is thrown out at the stage of late normoblast so this is an mcq a hp production starts at the level of proerythroblast that's an mcq reticulocyte doesn't have a nucleus rbc doesn't have a nucleus but late normoblast has a nucleus right now three different trends that we have to remember over here what are the three different trends the size of the cell the nucleus and the cytoplasm okay what are the three different trends we have nucleus size nucleus size decreases the trend is decreasing from hematopoietic stem cell to all the way into the late normoblast we see that the nucleus size is decreasing right that is one thing another thing that you have to know about the cytoplasm cytoplasm from basophilic cytoplasm to eosinophilic cytoplasm is going on these three points are very important high yield points for your viva and mcq this is an overview video so we are getting into the high yields only right and in the process of discussing rbc we will come in more details of these things the erythropoiesis do not worry but if you want to know the details right now go and check out the video on my channel that is erythropoiesis on nerd medic right and the third thing that you have to know is about nucleus or nucleus cytoplasm that the size the size of the cell as a whole whenever from a stem cell to a mature cell you move always the size will decrease size decreases Right, size decreases. So, hematopoietic stem cell is a very big, big cell, but RBCs are very small in comparison to that. So, the size decreases, 
as we move from hematopoietic stem cell to rbc the nuclear size also decreases and at one point of time the cell gets so filled up with a hemoglobin the nucleus is thrown away at what stage late normoblast they throw away the nucleus and cytoplasm from basophilic it converts into eosinophilic so this was some basic overview of the erythropoiesis now in the next video we will continue with the idea of the hematopoiesis at large we will be getting a overview of hematopoiesis over here what we just saw we saw hematopoietic stem cell we saw myeloid progenitor then myeloid progenitor was giving rise to erythroid progenitor and erythrocyte so this process we saw a bit we will be detailing that later on and we will be talking about the other processes as well so this was more or less the video for today i hope you enjoyed this video if you have enjoyed this video please hit the like button share this video among your friends in the medical school and hit the bell icon and so that you never miss a video from Med make medical easy and also if you want to learn more such content from me in my way of teaching go and check out my channel that is a nerd medic the link is again in the description box please do subscribe to my channel and if you have any doubts after watching this video please go to my insta handle that is at ayan underscore paricha zero zero so that you can post your doubts over there i will be answering those or you can send your doubts to the mme uh, platform they can redirect it to me right until then bye bye see you in the next one